Okay, welcome everybody to the second lecture on tabular data visualization. Um, um, we'll briefly review what we uh, talked about in the first tabular data lecture, um, and then we'll get started on like the more complex use cases for tabular data. Um, organizationally, um, you might have seen this post that I put on Slack about uh, new due dates, um, given that we are like canceling the class uh, of, on election day, and we also had a cancellation because of the windstorm. We've kind of rearranged the schedule a little bit. Um, so we, the proposal is now due end of October. Uh, the peer feedback session will be on November 5. The project milestone will be due on November 15. Um, and then after that project milestone, there will be a week in which you are supposed to meet with like your, you will be assigned, every group will be assigned um, 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 a mentor, um, and you're supposed to meet in that week. Um, after the milestone is submitted uh, with your mentor to discuss kind of like your progress and your project to kind of get you on track for the final project. And the final project originally was to due on the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, but now it's due on December 2nd. Um, and to make room for all of that, we had to move the second exam into exam week. And um, for exam week, we have to follow the registrar's guidelines when we can have an exam for class. Um, and so that will be on Friday, December the 11th, and it will be the same modality as before, starting exactly the class time, and then you have 24 hours until sa Saturday uh, at like 12.25. Um, any questions about these changes to the schedule or any other processes or anything about the projects? Uh, yes, the online schedule has been changed. Um, also, the assignments have already been updated in, in, in Canvas. Great. So then let's get started. Um, so last time uh, we met, we talked about data, uh, uh, about data set types. And well, we talked about tabular data visualization uh, and the tabular data ta tables are like one of the most important structured data sets. Um, we have tables, networks, real geometry, clusters, and set lists um, as these data set types. And we talked about uh, tables as being like, a super important um, example of, of these data sets. And we have like specific visualization techniques for tabular data. And I kind of tried to make this point. Um, well, I can mute everybody. 
I realized although I didn't hear anything, I had my audio turned off. So if anybody asked a question, uh, I'm sorry, can you just restate it? Okay, great. Um, so um, we talked about um, like how you deal with the tables me um, it depends a little bit on on the scale of the table right um, is it a very big table in terms of records is it a very big table in terms of dimension but also is the table like is the data the dimensions in the table are they homogeneous or are they uh, different uh, from each other like we had this example with beats per minute and we did like a little exercise on that uh, and compared to age gender weight and, and so depending on like the scale of your data set, you can either do like pure data visualization for high dimensional data sets, or you have to use some kind of like analytics to do things like dimensionality reduction or clustering or something like that. But we'll talk more about these kinds of like analytical methods in the filtering and aggregation uh, lecture in one of the last um, lectures um, of the semester. And then we talked about like uh, these techniques and tasks, and it was also part of like a question on the exam. So I'm, I'm sure that everybody has thought about this a little bit more since. Uh, so we have different kinds of things that we want to judge when we look at tabula data, like magnitude, distribution, deviation, correlation, ranking, part of the whole change over time. Um, and um, I gave you a pointer to this, um, this kind of visual vocabulary that has been compiled by the Financial Times to give you um, like suggestions on how to visualize each of these, um, like visualize tabula data for each of these tasks. And so just to briefly over, like, review this for, for magnitude, we really like there's uh, bar charts or isotypes for part of a whole relationships. We have stacked par charts, pie and donut charts, tree maps, and then like for time series, we would also have like these part of whole um, like uh, stacked area charts, but then we'll talk a little bit more about them in the time series. Then we spend a fair amount of time on distributions, um, especially like, um, histograms, how histograms are constructed, that binning is important for histograms, uh, then kernel density estimations, which are kind of like give you a curve that is uh, like that is kind of like designed to um, like give you a good guess of the underlying distribution. And we talked about that like uh, for histograms where you uh, vary the bin size for kernel density estimation, you vary some kind of like window or your kernel that you're using. We talked about box plots and how they are like, okay, if you want to use data or if you want to visualize data that is roughly normally distributed, but it can be kind of tricky if you have non-normally distributed data. Um, and, and like one good alternative that can show this is the violin plot, which is just like basically a KDE that is mirrored and shows you the median and some like uh, the interquartile range here. Um, all kinds of like aggregation uh, visualizations are kind of sensitive to outliers. So the important piece here or to kind of artifacts in the data. So the important piece here is to actually like look at the data before you uh, visualize something in, um, um, in some kind of like summary uh, visualization here. Um, then we talked a lot about change over time here. The line chart was kind of like the big winner. We talked about the pros and cons of stack area versus line charts and, and I guess the like the overall, um, the overall conclusion is it depends a little bit. Like, what is what do you want to show? Is it like a global trend and something um, that is stacked might be good? But if you want to uh, emphasize the individual components, something like individual line charts might be good. Um, then we talked about like you can embed these little line charts in 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 like with very little space and a couple of techniques to make this even more space efficient. Um, and then for another technique for time series data would be the connected scatter plot, which is interesting if you have two variables, you want to show some correlation and how that correlation changes over time. Um, and that's roughly where we stopped. Um, and so today um, I want to get started talking about ranking. Um, and so for ranking, uh, we'll have like an activity, um, this, this design exercise, and let me put the link in here. So here's the um, here's the document that contains that exercise, um, and so this is like German soccer clubs um, ranked over the first seven rounds of the championship, um, and I would like to like set up some breakout rooms now and um, 
have you think a little bit about how you could visualize this data? Um, and in the instructions, you will also see that um, like first, first thing you should do is you should uh, try to design a visualization for this kind of data set. Uh, but then you should also think about if you don't only want to show the rank, but you also want to show the points that uh, a team has after each round. So is, are these instructions clear before I open up the breakout rooms? Okay, so I'll um, give you like between seven and 10 minutes um, and then we'll come back and discuss how we can do rankings. <laughs> 
Okay. Uh, what were the kinds of solutions that you guys came up with? For us, I guess the idea we had was sort of making a line chart of basically week on the x-axis yep. and the position on the, or like rank on the y-axis and then have the y axis and then, yeah, it's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. And then six lines, one for each team. Yeah. Yeah, that seems like a reasonable solution. Anybody else have something um, similar or very different? Uh, just two line charts uh, just linked. So you hover over a team and it shows it on both. And then you add two filters on the side to filter for what teams you're interested in. If you're interested in, say, tracking different rivalries. And then uh, one filter for if you just want to look at, say, the top 10 teams to simplify the two. Yeah. And then, yeah, it's just a one tracking rankings and then the other tracking number of points in the y-axis, but both use rounds. Yeah. Cool. Any other um, ideas? We talked about uh, parallel coordinates where like the dividers for parallel coordinates would be the rounds um, and then maybe for the, the cumulative points, either labels or maybe like a separate line plot like others have mentioned. Yeah. Cool, this sounds like great ideas. Um, and this is, actually, this is a problem that somebody has written a paper on exactly like that. Um, so here are some, like you probably, did, uh, the, the thing that line charts with the points that you did, uh, described sounds very much like this bump chart that we can see here, here on the bottom right. Um, if you didn't have temporal rankings, then you could just do something like um, a line chart, uh, a bar chart, but I'll show you a couple of more nuanced things about that um, later. But here, this is kind of like this exact um, case that we just did in this exercise, a soccer table. Um, and they, they looked, uh, okay, present view, I'm sharing the wrong screen then. So, is this better now? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so here, um, this is exactly this, this example. Um, and I'll briefly show this video. This is about, uh, this is a Kai paper from 2014. Um, and it's, it's about interaction and interaction techniques about exploring these kinds of soccer tables, but also with a little bit more nuance to it and not just the wins uh, or the points, but also like the usual statistics that you look at if you look at soccer tables. So. We present at Table, an interactive table improving temporal navigation in soccer ranking tables. Standard ranking tables for soccer championships display teams as rows and points and other statistics as columns, such as the number of wins or the number of goals conceded. Teams are ranked according to one column, by default the accumulated number of points. In a championship, the values of the dimensions for each team change each time a team plays a game. Thus, the table contents and row ordering change for each day of the championship. Without visual help, it is almost impossible to track changes, observe teams' evolution, or generally perform temporal tasks. To perform temporal tasks, well-known visualization and interaction techniques may help, such as sliders to browse the temporal dimension, animated transitions and row highlighting to follow a team, and column sorting to rank teams according to a specific dimension. However, performing complex temporal tasks is difficult using these generic techniques. We introduced two new interactive techniques to enhance temporal navigation in ranking tables. Drag cell is a direct manipulation technique to browse time by interacting in the value domain instead of the time domain. First, the user mouse clicks a cell corresponding to a team's dimension. By dragging the mouse up and down, she explores the value domain of the cell. Arrows indicate a preview of each team's behavior if the mouse were to be released, and a temporal slider displays feedback. When releasing the mouse, the table changes to the time at which the team has the selected value. The arrows disappear. For example, let's answer the following common question addressed by soccer analysts. When did a team reach the theoretical number of points, 42, to be safe from being downgraded to the minor league? Using traditional interaction techniques, the user would browse the temporal dimension to find the first time at which a particular team, here, Montpellier, obtains a value greater or equal to 42 in the points column. 
Using drag cell, the user interacts directly with the value domain to perform the task, making the interaction more direct and faster. The second technique, VizRank, uses line charts as a temporary overview of the championship. First, the user clicks a cell corresponding to a team and a dimension. VizRank animates the table into a timeline format by widening the columns and rows. The y-axis of the chart represents the selected dimension's values, while the x-axis represents time. One line chart is displayed for each previously selected team using semantically resonant colors. An inspector shows the values of each line chart. VizRank provides two scales, an absolute scale, mapping line charts on the dimension values, and a relative scale, mapping line charts on ranks. The user can also select or unselect teams to show or hide their corresponding line chart. Finally, clicking the overview chart transforms it back into a table using the inverse transition with the selected time value. OK, so yeah, this is very close to um, what you guys described in your um, that you did in your exercise. And I think um, that just shows that some simple ideas, if you make them like nicely accessible by smart interactions, they can be very powerful and they can really um, like visualize something like that in, in a quite an engaging way. So um, one type of um, ranking visualizations is, is essentially like we've done this in, in homeworks and so on. Um, we can just like visualize a table, right? Um, we could like do this in a spreadsheet or we can do this in uh, in a table where we do these uh, bar charts instead of the cells. Um, and this is kind of like a technique that goes back a long while um, to this technique that's called the table lens. And this is like, um, was developed still at Xerox Park. If you're like uh, interested in, in like um, history of graphical computing, you will know that Xerox Park is, has been kind of like at the forefront of like user interfaces, graphical user interfaces. And here, uh, this is like a short demo on what this tool example, can do. This is a table of the 1986 baseball statistics with 323 rows of players and 23 columns of data. We can put the data into a spreadsheet but even using a 21 inch workstation display, the data requires nine full screen vertical scrolls and two horizontal scrolls, making it hard to work with. It's hard to find players or see interesting patterns. In short, it's hard to make sense of the information. We've devised a new way of visualizing and interacting with large tables called the table lens, which exploits graphical representations to compress the information onto the display. In this column, at BATS, we integrate a familiar bar chart representation directly into the textual view of a table. Some of the rows, those in focus, show underlying textual values along with the graphical bars. Other rows, those in the context, show only graphical representations, thus requiring less space. By displaying the entire table graphically with only some of it in focus, this 324 row by 24 column table can be shown using a portion of the screen. The table lens displays 30 to 100 times as much information as a spreadsheet in the same space. With a small set of manipulation operations, the table lens allows fluid navigation and exploration of the data. The focus area can be manipulated using control points and or keyboard commands. The number of cells in the focal area can be increased or decreased. The focal area can be moved to different rows or columns. Since the essential geometry of the table is preserved, multiple focal areas can be created. To facilitate browsing of context cell values, a mouse feedback area at the bottom of the window shows column, row, and value information. The graphical representations make it easy to spot trends and patterns and to isolate outliers or unusual cases. For example, sorting a column can reveal relationships to other columns. Here, sorting career at bats reveals correlations in several nearby columns. Notice that career hits is strongly correlated or proportional to at-bats. In other words, most players have similar batting averages. Some players stick out from the curve, two well-known batting stars, Wade Boggs and Don Mattingly. To confirm these observations, we divide career hits by career at-bats, creating a new column, career average. The batting average curve is reasonably flat as the correlation of the curves suggested, though increasingly noisy with decreasing career at-bats. Furthermore, 
The length of the bar shows that Boggs and Mattingly have the highest two career averages. Okay, so you get the idea. Um, also note these kind of like cool interaction techniques of kind of like mouse interactions for sorting and so on. Uh, and we've kind of like moved away from this in, on desktops, but it's now, um, I guess, um, uh, mobile uh, interfaces we have, things like that uh, now again. Um, and so um, I want to talk a little bit about the case of multi, um, like multi-dimensional rankings. Um, and especially about this lineup technique, which is like a paper that um, I wrote with some colleagues uh, a, a couple of years ago. Um, and so uh, the idea is that most rankings, for example, if you rank something as complex as a university, um, they're kind of like composed of multiple attributes. So for example, if you rank university, you might kind of like consider like student faculty ratio, you might consider like the cost of the uh, tuition, um, and like maybe you will have some kind of like, um, additional um, aspect like do you care about like what are your um, faculties research active or things like that um, and then when you rank universities you have to kind of like uh, bring this down to uh, like a very complicated thing like a university you have to kind of bring this down into one numerical score and of course how you create the score depends a lot on like how you choose to weigh the different things so for example if you're looking for like a, a, a grad um, like grad school, you might care more about like uh, citations for faculty. Um, if you're looking for an undergraduate school, you might care more about like student faculty ratio, things like that. Um, and different um, like providers of rankings, be it universities or uh, any kinds of other things, uh, they, they kind of like bring in their own biases here. And the idea um, of this technique was to kind of like let people dynamically do that. And so how can we kind of like start off with this? So first, like, let's suppose we have a, a ranking here. Um, and at the very basic, we just have like the rank, like here is a ranked list. We have one, two, three, four, five, uh, some universities. Um, however, like we don't really know from this uh, visualization or from this chart here, is MIT very much better than Harvard or, or is there a big gap between them? And so we can kind of like get that information if we also show a score on top of the ranking here. So we can see that the differences between ranking two, one and two aren't all that big in this example here. But as I said, um, we, we really want to also support multiple attributes. So, um, and we, we thought about a couple of ways how we can do that. Um, and we, we came up with these combiner functions. So the first thing, the simplest example is actually a weighted sum. So where you have like three dimensions, like A, B, and C, um, and you like create um, a score based on like a weighted sum of those things. Um, and now the question is, of course, how do you determine those weights? Um, and I'll talk about this a little bit uh, later, but you could also have like situations where you care about the maximum or the product or nesting or some super custom function. So all of these are, are conceivably possible. Um, and we created kind of like um, visual um, analogies for each of those, like a serial combiner, a parallel combiner, and then complex combiner. So let me give you an example of what I mean by a serial combiner. So here now we have like three dimensions, A, B, and C, that we want to compose our score of. Um, and the first thing we can do is uh, if we want to look at the overall score, we can just like trans uh, transition this into a stacked bar chart. And now we kind of like have our score and we can also see how the score is composed. So you can, for example, see that uh, rank uh, three, Princeton here had like a lot smaller value in A, but makes up for it in B essentially. Um, and now if we wanted to adjust these, these weights, we could dynamically do that. You could say um, A is much more important to us. And so I've kind of like adjusted the weight in the example at the top, and then I can readjust the ranking. And after I have or the scores, and after I have um, adjusted the scores, I can update the ranking. Um, okay, and so um, here is like an example of how this is implemented in the system. Um, you see different universities, different columns. You have like faculty student ratio, employer reputation, citation per faculty. Um, we can kind of like rearrange all of these elements uh, flexibly. We can sort by any of them dynamically. Um, and then we can, um, start creating these like combined uh, ranking functions. So let's say we wanna uh, create a sum of uh, employer reputation, faculty student ratio and citations per faculty, and then uh, rank based on that. 
Um, so now we get kind of like two a first rough ranking where all of those three things are roughly rated equally. And then we can dynamically start adjusting the weights by, by using drag and drop here. So if we like increase the faculty student ratio because we might be more interested in the teaching mission of the university, you can see that the rank changes um, and you see these like um, animations with like these little um, colors to kind of make it a little bit more salient for a longer time um, after the fact. Okay, now that we've created like uh, a ranking that we care about, uh, we, we can only think about like, okay, how like this only works if what we have in the table where like if we have these stacked um, bars, the, the like it kind of assumes that high value is good. Uh, but that's not the case um, in, uh, in like generically, right? Sometimes a low value could be good. For example, if you were to like, rank whatever uh, genes by p-values of some effect. You want low p-values and you want to, uh, these genes that have a high p-value uh, ranked highly. And so what we did here is kind of like um, create a, a mapping tool like a, a, to create a transfer function. So this would be like our initial where we have like, this is very similar to if you use a scale in D3, right? You have like your, uh, your domain and then you map it to some kind of like, um, range in this case from zero to one that you didn't visualize. So if you have just like a generic mapping from min to max, you have like a straight line here connecting the two of them and like a value at roughly three, 0 0.3 would correspond to a part chart like you see at the top. But what would happen if I tried an inverted mapping, then I would have some like a, a low input value would correspond to a high output value. Um, and so we experimented with kind of like a couple of different uh, visual arrangements. And so uh, one way to think about this is really this is a function, right? And so you could display this as, um, as like a function in, um, with an X and a Y dimension. Um, and we actually did like a brief user study on this, what people preferred. And we, we just tested this with like 12 people. 11 of the 12 people preferred like this parallel version. And one person preferred this like more mathematical representation, but this was also a mathematician. So it's kind of like your training matters. But how this looks like um, in the system is, is this. Um, so here you have kind of scores. This is like now um, arts and how strong is a university in, within arts and humanities. And so now you can kind of like uh, dynamically create these scores and immediately see like a representation in code right below it. Um, this is this um, alternative function editor that I mentioned. Uh, and here you can also do like graphically nonlinear transformations, although that does get a little bit complex. Um, and then there's also like a set of standard mappings that you could pick. So for example, you could kind of invert scores. And if you invert scores, then you have like Virginia Polytech, which isn't necessarily like an art school, uh, now ranks at the very top. So the next thing that you could think about is like, hey, um, of course, um, they, these ranking is objective, right? And I could try to compare them. Um, and every kind of like every school will try to optimize their own rankings uh, or and like, yeah, th th this is very, um, very subjective. And so you want to look at different situations. And so the way we, we designed the, this comparison here is to essentially show you multiple views and connect them with, with these bump charts. So now you see in the first ranking, MIT uh, is at number one. It stays at number one in the second ranking, and then it goes down to number two in the third ranking. Um, and uh, we can, like in the live system, you can simply take a snapshot of any of these rankings and then uh, dynamically um, adjust any of those rankings, and you will see immediately where do those individual dimension or these individual rows end up between those two rankings. So you see that like here, Imperial College of London is now better on the left than on the right. Um, but you can also make these like stronger transitions um, um, as you see here. So um, if you wanna play with this, this is now we actually ported this to a web tool um, and I'll actually show uh, a demo. This is now integrated in the bigger table visualization and I show, I'll show a demo of this a little bit later.
Um, so yeah, these, these rankings are super popular. Um, the other thing that like when we talk about tabular data is of course, very, very important is looking at correlations. Um, like how do two dimensions correlate um, across all of the rows in a table? Um, and so like, well, what is a correlation? Um, how do two variables behave relative to each other? And we have kind of like ways to describe correlation mathematically with like our squared values or, or things like that. But they also um, are like usually visually very um, evident. So here, this is like a picture from Wikipedia showing you some kind of like um, R squared values and uh, how that underlying pattern looks. And for the first two rows, we can see that this roughly um, um, is corresponds to our intuition, but like a simple R squared value doesn't really show you anything uh, for these more complex patterns at the bottom here, which we can spot visually. So um, there are like we look at correlations mostly with our frequently with axis based techniques. Um, so axis based techniques are like mostly scatter plot matrices and parallel coordinates. And so we'll take a look at those in, in detail now. And so scatter plots um, in, the, in the simplest form, it's just two orthogonal axes visualizing one dimension each. Um, and then you have to just choose how do you encode the mark. You know, is it just a simple dot uh, or um, do you also want to encode additional dimensions? Like here, we're encoding it by uh, also by size and by um, like this, these are countries and the bubbles or the marks just are scaled by the population. And then we also have a color for the continent. So we have like two additional variables on top of it. Um, the big question in scatter plots is of course, how do you deal with many, many data points? Because you kind of get these overlaps in this example here, we're dealing with um, with it with kind of some transparency, but of course that doesn't work if you have 200,000 data points, for example. Um, one thing that is always useful in, in a scatter plot is like if you can show um, like some statistical information such as regression lines. Um, so um, you can calculate regression lines by using least squares to minimize the sum of the squares of the errors. Uh, this is kind of like also uh, commonly available in statistics packages and, and tools like ggplot and so on. You can like, if you show a scatter plot, it can automatically plot your reg uh, regression lines. Um, but of course you shouldn't overdo that, right? Here's like a humorous take of XKCD on it. Like you, I don't trust linear regression when it's harder to guess the direction of the correlation from the scatter plot and to find new constellations in it. So be mindful um, and just recall ANSCOMBIS quartet, which we've like talked about um, before, um, that they have like these, these four data sets, they have kind of like these simple statistics. Uh, they, they are identical, even though the data sets are very different. So like one limitation of a scatter plot is that you really can only look at correlations between uh, two dimensions at the same time. And so, if you want to look at more dimensions uh, simultaneously, one way to do this is to simply create a matrix of multiple scatter plots, and that's called like a scatter plot matrix. Uh, if you show all of the dimensions, you have a matrix of size d by d, where each row and each column it corresponds to one dimension, um, and the cells correspond kind of like to the intersection of the row and the uh, the dimensions identified by the row and the dimension here. So this here is a simple, uh, a simple example with this iris data set that you probably have seen if you have ever taken a machine learning or a data science class um, where you have like sepal lengths, sepal width, petal length, and petal width and plotted against each other. And then we have the three different plant species that are shown here um, in, in uh, blue, green, and red. Um, and you can see that like some of the classes separate nicely um, in, uh, in basically every dimensions but to separate the blue and the green one, you kind of have to look at some kind of like higher dimensional uh, combination. It's not, it's not quite as clear. Um, so we can create these scatterplot matrices in theory, um, like uh, for like arbitrary many dimensions, but in practice, we kind of like are stuck with about 20 dimensions. And then suddenly it gets really overwhelming because um, these uh, individual scatterplots get, get pretty small. We can deal with about 500 to 1,000 records simultaneously um, because we have like these, um, each scatter plot is independent. It's kind of like a classical multiple coordinated view problem, 
brushing is really important to show like where is a particular point in another uh, in another scatter plot. Um, and in, if you look at like uh, advanced visualization systems, you often combine like these small scatter plots in a scatter plot matrix with like a focus scatter plot uh, using a focus and context technique. Um, and if you want to deal, like if you want to like enhance your scatter plot matrix with some kind of algorithmic approaches, um, you could do things like clustering records to kind of show you groups um, and visualize these cluster relationships in scatter plots. You could also consider aggregation uh, to deal with scalability. Um, and then if you have a lot of dimensions, you can also look at like automatic, try to automatically choose dimensions. Um, to show you the most important effects in the data, or you could choose the ordering so that you see um, important um, combinations easily. Um, an example of like uh, dealing with scale is this um, kind of like aggregation here. And so this isn't the scatterplot anymore, but it's more or less like a heat map, or you could also call it like a bin scatterplot matrix. Um, in this case, um, now, like I'm visualizing 100,000 data points that have been binned into these heat maps. And, and the point of this particular technique is that it's still interactive. Um, so this is, this is kind of like about the indexing data structure in the back end uh, and how, how you can do that and how you can like easily resolve these relationships even for like, let me try like a million data points and see what this does. So you can see it, it gets a little slower. But even with a million data point, it works just fine. Right? I can select any of these elements, um, and then I see the corresponding highlighted um, pieces in uh, all of these other dimensions. So that's kind of like a, a, a way of dealing with really large scale. Um, and then uh, people have kind of th thought about like how can I actually navigate these uh, scatter plot matrices. Um, and this is like a famous this paper from um, like probably a decade ago, and I'll show a brief, brief video about this. The Scatterdice application is a prototype implementation of our scatterplot matrix navigation technique. Scatterdice consists of four main components, a scatterplot, a scatterplot matrix, a query layer control box, and a navigation bar. The main scatterplot visualization shows the current position in the scatterplot matrix. In other words, two of the dimensions in the data set. A set of simple navigation techniques allow for controlling the position in the scatterplot matrix. The keyboard or the navigation bar can be used for stepping one position in the matrix at a time. Movement is performed as an animated 3D transition from one scatterplot to another, where one dimension remains constant. The user can also scratch the current position in the matrix to see the animated transition from one dimension to the next. To move directly from one part of the scatterplot matrix to another, it is also possible to perform a hyperjump. If the user wants to see the intervening positions, the path planning interaction transitions automatically from one position to another. Finally, path drawing allows the user to draw the path to traverse on the surface of the scatterplot matrix. Scatterdice allows the user to build queries using the query layer box and a lasso tool and then see how the query is distributed in other plots. The user can move an eccentric label lens on the plot to see the nominal names of the data points. This also works with query selections. Finally, the rows and columns of the matrix can be reordered, either manually using drag and drop or automatically using the pairwise correlation of the dimensions. We will follow a user who is employing scatter dice using a graphical tablet for smooth and easy interaction. After loading a data set of 1033 cameras, the user first decides to look at the price distribution of the cameras and navigates to this position. He builds queries for the four different price ranges of cameras. He then moves right in the scatterplot matrix to study the release year of these four groups of cameras. Using the eccentric label lens, he is able to drill down into the data set to see the names of the cameras. The user wants to study the weight of the cameras and thus drags and drops the weight column next to the current column. He then steps to the right again. Wide and telezoom are important for our users, so he uses path planning to navigate to the corresponding scatterplot. Okay, I think everybody gets the idea. So this is kind of like a cool way of navigating um, in a scatterplot matrix. 
Um, uh, I especially like the whole query uh, query aspects here. Uh, what do you guys think about the transitions here? I hated the transitions. I thought they were annoying. Wow. Okay, anybody else hated the transition? Yeah, I, I thought it was fine for one to the next one over, but the one that they called a hyper jump where it showed lots of transitions from here to here to here to here to here to here to here, to here that was just too much. Yeah. Honestly, I would have just preferred a linked view in the, in the dashboard, just multiple charts so I can see immediately when I'm lassoing what I'm, how that changes what I'm seeing in other charts. I, I don't know. To me, it just seemed kind of unnecessary. Yeah. So um, I, I tend to agree, right? That there is like this idea of linking between the scatter plot. Um, it, it's smart and also the whole brushing piece. But the 3D transitions, they're just really, really hard to follow, right? Especially if you play them as fast as the indigenous video. Um, and, and so um, that's maybe like here, people have tried to push the boundaries of what's possible with, in terms of interaction, uh, but it might not have been the best solution from like a usability point of view. Okay, um, any else questions about like scatter plots or uh, are you ready to move on to parallel coordinates? Great. So parallel coordinates, they are a technique that uh, they were originally in invented by Alfred Inselberg, uh, who is like an Israeli mathematician who unfortunately passed away this year. Um, and he uh, first published a paper about this in 1985. And so the idea here is that uh, like in a scatter plot, you have an X, like in this example here, an X and a Y axis representing a dimension and they're orthogonal to each other. Um, in parallel coordinates, the X and the Y axis are parallel to each other. And so in a scatter plot, you would plot um, these points that correspond to the items in the table um, at the point uh, defined by its y and its x position. position. Um, in a parallel coordinates plot, you would kind of like um, take each point and um, mark it at these axes. So like uh, A is high in x and B is low in x and B is high uh, in y and A is low in y and then connect the specific item with a line. So B and A um, are now connected across those two different dimensions. And so now we can see that there is kind of like this inverse relationship between X and Y um, and the, uh, with respect to the items A and B. So these are the two like equivalent representations um, on the left in scatter plots, on the right um, in uh, parallel coordinates. So, um, so why, why do we do this? Well, one thing is that with uh, parallel coordinates, we can fairly easily and a little bit more, let's say, uh, like space efficiently uh, represent multiple dimensions. Um, so here we have each axis representing one dimensions, again, from this car data set. And I did show this, this example before when I talked about brushing. Um, and the lines connecting these axes here represent the records. Uh, the cool thing about this is that this works for all kinds of data types. Um, so um, like if we had like a regular line chart, which is of course very similar, um, if we had each of these dimensions be a time point um, and we had uh, homogeneous data, like whatever the speed of the car over time, then there would just be a line chart. But here we kind of generalize this idea to not time points, but to different dimensions. Um, and then we can see kind of like um, these, these, these trends. And so let me just go to this example here. So what we can see here, um, like between the weight and acceleration, the lines cross, right? You see that the lines either go down or up. And so we see this kind of crossing patterns, which indicates like an inverse relationship. So, uh, but in, in contrast, if we have something like here that there's not a lot of crossing lines, they mostly move in parallel with some exceptions. Uh, then we could say, hey, this looks like we mostly have like a, a linear relationship uh, or a, like a, a, a linear relationship between those two items. Um, and of course, um, like as I mentioned in the in interaction lecture, it's really important to be able to brush these kinds of plots so that I can see these, uh, like how a certain, um, a certain range of items behaves across dimensions because one of the big downsides of parallel coordinates is actually that we, um, that we really mostly see um, repair-wise relationships between dimensions. So for example, it's not, it's almost impossible to, 
uh, judge the relationship between weight and displacement without brushing. And so what I could do is I could rearrange it, right? And then I can now see the, the relationship between weight and displacement here. Or of course I could use brushing so that I can see across uh, multiple dimensions. Um, of course, there is a limit on how many dimensions you can show. Like here, I've tried to visualize um, 500 dimensions in uh, a parallel coordinate plot, and obviously, this is just noise. Um, and so that's not uh, all that useful. There are other visualization techniques that, um, that, that actually can show something like this, um, and we'll talk about them a little bit later, like heat maps. Um, and then this is actually the very first visualization technique I ever implemented myself in 2008. I, I tried to implement this parallel coordinate plot, and then I was very disappointed when it looked like this. Uh, so we had a ton of uh, clutter in this example, but there's a simple fix here. Um, I can simply use transparency uh, for the lines to get an idea of what are the patterns here. So if you have like a lot of items, this first thing you should do is to uh, to um, like make your line slightly transparent. It's not all that easy to automatically guess the right value for transparency, but uh, you could do it manually. Um, and then you can do things like bundling or clustering, or you can also sample. And so there's like multiple papers on um, this. This works for other visualizations too, but um, for parallel coordinates, it works especially well that if you have a very large data set, you can probably just display um, as a random sample of it and still get most of the patterns that's, uh, that are being uh, visualized. So yeah, I, I talked about these limitations that correlations really only work between adjacent axes. Uh, the solutions here are interaction, either brushing or changing the order. Um, some of the weaknesses of parallel coordinates are that there, it's, there is some ambiguity, right? So if you have, um, like in this left example here, you don't know whether like be left of the axis and right of the axis, which how lines continue, right? Like we, we, we don't know. Um, so this is a problem. Uh, similarly, for the example on the right, it gets just a little bit more complicated. Um, so the solution to something like that would be, of course, uh, to use simply color highlighting. You could also do um, curves. Uh, people have studied that. Like if you, if you instead of doing straight lines, if you use curves, you can resolve some of these ambiguities fairly easily. So like in summary, um, parallel coordinates show a relationship between adjacent axes primarily. Um, they have limited scalability of about 50 dimensions, which is actually already a lot, um, and like one to 5,000 records. Um, if you use transparent line, interaction is really important. You need things like axis reordering, brushing, filtering, or even inverting the axis. Um, and if you wanted to make this a little bit more scalable, you could again use things like choosing dimensions, choosing order, and then clustering and aggregating records. And so I'll show you an example here for clustering and aggregating records. This is a paper, it's also pretty old already, um, so, uh, that you, where you could simply apply hierarchical clustering um, to um, a data set. And then you visualize, um, instead of actually visualizing the individual lines, you just visualize the cluster centroids and how these cluster centroids behave. And so that's roughly the idea here. Um, and um, like here, you're actually showing the, not, not only the centroid, but also so kind of like a band um, with transparency here um, that shows you roughly where that cluster is situated. Um, and, and because it's a hierarchical clustering, and we'll talk more about how this all works, uh, we can dynamically step through how many clusters we want to see. And so here's an example on the top left. We've kind of aggregated the whole data set in a single cluster, and then we uh, split it up into more and more and more clusters. Um, so, um, and yeah, at some point it gets pretty cluttered, but maybe uh, something like in the bottom left is, is like a good uh, representation here. Um, very related to parallel coordinates are star plots. Um, and so star plots, instead of like showing these axes in parallel, they show them radiating out from one point. Um, so that kind of is neat because we get these nice shapes um, that represent certain, um, like say profiles. Uh, one downside of these star plots is that they, because we have like using a lot less space, especially closer to the origin, 
it kind of gets very cluttered. Um, and so I usually recommend star plots. They're, they're kind of like evocative and interesting, but I usually recommend them uh, for like, just like show one item per plot and then do multiple plots. And so here is like a good example of, of exactly that. Um, and you might've seen this on a beer bottle. Uh, some of the Utah breweries um, use these flavor profiles in the star plots. Um, and this, in this case, is flavor profiles of different uh, Scotch uh, distilleries. And so you see that like uh, how multi fruity floral body are sweet, smoky, honey, spicy is a particular whiskey. And if you just like skim through that, uh, where are like our smoky whiskeys, then uh, we might see like Lafroix and Lagavulin are both known to be very smoky, right? And you see they have this very spiky, extreme uh, flavor profile. And so I think this is interesting, but you, you definitely shouldn't try to like visualize many items in the same plot here. Um, I mentioned a little bit uh, data reduction as a way of dealing uh, with uh, large data sets. And so like one thing to do is sampling. Um, as I mentioned before, you can do random sampling that works pretty well. So here is like an example of um, on the left and the right uh, in a parallel coordinate plot, all, uh, all dimensions are shown, but in the middle it's randomly sampled. Um, and so you can see very nicely that um, we can see some patterns in the middle, but we can't see anything on, uh, on the left and the right. Um, and one thing, if you do that, if you implement a parallel coordinates plot like that, um, you uh, like want to filter or sample only for display purposes. But if I then apply a brush, you want to apply that brush to all of the data. And so that gets a little bit tricky from a technical point of view. Um, you kind of have to load in more data as you brush. Um, uh, there's also smarter sampling strategies because like one problem with random sampling is that you might remove outliers. Um, and so there's outlier preserving approaches out there as well. Um, and then of course, um, a simple way to do data reduction is filtering. You can do um, like interactive filtering or you can have like some uh, hard criteria to uh, remove elements. So like these are the basic ideas and now we can start to uh, mix all of this up. Um, and, and this is kind of like an extreme case here. Um, this paper really just demonstrates that this is a very flexible concept and I can do, I can uh, draw axes arbitrarily and then I can uh, connect them. And uh, let me see whether this demo still works. Yes. So here um, is like a live demo of how you could play with something like this. So I have my cars data set that we are all already familiar with. And then I could draw like an axis here, like I'm drawing miles per gallon here. Now I'm selecting my cylinders and I could draw them here. Um, and now I could say, uh, I wanna connect these two here uh, with a parallel coordinates plot. And now I can go back and like move this around. So now I can create pretty crazy uh, visualizations actually with it. And now if I kind of like arrange them like this, uh, this isn't an all that like, great visualization. So I could say, maybe I wanna like do this as a scatter plot instead, or in addition to that. And now I could add something like a dimension that shows me the weight of the cars um, in addition to that. Um, and now I could do like curved relationships here. Mm -hmm. That seems to not work. Let's try linear. Yeah, that works again. And so I, I could kind of like create these, these, these bizarre arrangements uh, myself um, and, and play with all of these different um, options that I have here. Um, and um, I showed a video of this before. This is kind of a generalization of that, um, where, we have, where, where we have these kinds of axes and then we make them partially scatter plots. Partially, we make them parallel coordinate plots. Um, and then we integrate heat maps and we also integrate parallel sets, which we'll talk about in a minute um, and so on. And so you can kind of like create these fairly um, intricate visualizations. So here, 
like we're, we're showing like number one hits, like Whitney Houston had a lot of number one hits. We're showing this across countries. So here, Whitney Houston um, kind of like seems to be more popular in the United States and in Canada than she is in much of Europe, but she's also fairly popular in Australia. Um, and then see how many studio albums did she have? When was her first album versus the start of her career? Um, is she like still active or inactive? We see she, um, at that point, uh, here she's uh, marked as inactive, she's female and so on. So you can kind of like trace this a lot uh, across many different dimensions. Okay, so a very close relative to parallel coordinates are parallel sets. Um, and the difference for parallel sets is that they don't apply to, uh, they, they're, they're, they're trying to do for categorical data what parallel coordinates are doing for numerical data. Um, and uh, categorical data is, of course, discrete, and we have like a small number of values, um, and then we don't have any implied ordering between attributes. And so what we want to do is we want to find relationships between attributes um, in like an interactive driven technique here. And so um, the idea of parallel coordinates is really simply to have these boxes. And so here, this is like our um, like a Titanic data set that I've already mentioned before. Uh, we have class and sex. Uh, and um, in class, we see that we have like, this is scaled by the number of people um, that uh, ha had tickets for that class, first class, second class, third class, and crew. Um, and uh, we can see like first class um, roughly splits evenly between female and male here. Whereas second class here um, is, tends to be like a little bit less female, a little bit more male. And third class tends to be like, much fewer female passengers um, than um, male passengers, uh, as we can see here. And crew tends to be almost exclusively male. And only this like tiny outlier here connects to the female plot. And so we now can see these proportional uh, relationships across these two different dimensions. Um, and um, people, of course, like have implemented this in, in D3. And so here we see this example with the Titanic. So who survived? If I like um, see, if I um, look at, at sex here, we can see that like the majority of females actually um, survived. Um, but uh, for a few, of course, uh, did also perish. Um, if we look at um, age, there were not a lot of children on board. But it looks like the um, like the majority of children did survive. We can mostly see that by the color coding here, um, and um, correspondingly, we can see that the majority of the crew did actually uh, perish in the Titanic disaster. Um, and we can like select individual elements and rearrange things here um, dynamically if we want to. And that like, you can, instead of showing um, like blocks, you can also do curves, which is kind of like fairly easy if you have a tool like D3 that simply like uses a different function depending on what you're showing. Oops. Um, and in the original paper, they also tried to like um, integrate this with um, additional visualizations of the distributions. Um, so here, like uh, we show um, histograms uh, of these elements of what, what like, this is now a different data sets. This is like um, based on, uh, looks like employment uh, status. Um, in, uh, and you can see that distribution um, plotted inside of these individual boxes combined with these like parallel uh, parallelograms that connect uh, the individual dimensions here. But it does get a little bit complicated. And of course, there's like interactions you could reorder to kind of resol resolve uh, possible um, like overlaps and so on uh, dynamically. And then you could also group elements so that you make like here, we're making second and third class into like one big group to simplify this a little bit further. Um, and then we can also filter out like the remove third and crew here completely and to show only first and second. So this, these are just examples of how you could simplify a plot like this. Um, or highlight with them. Okay, so parallel sets are like a cool way to visualize um, relationships between categorical data sets. Um, and so if, if you ever find yourself in that situation, um, I would definitely recommend looking at them. <laughs> 
Okay, so um, the last big category of tabular data visualizations are grid or matrix or explicit tabular based representations. Um, and so um, this is uh, really, um, think of it as like a spreadsheet. Each variable here is its own column and the visual encodings um, of the cells is used to make it scalable. The prototypical example would be the heat map, but it can be any, it could be anything. Like here is a, an example um, that, that um, I did with a couple of other people uh, and we used um, bar charts and color codes and uh, also like aggregate representations to do such a tabular representation um, flexibly and dynamically. Um, and so this is where I kind of like wanted to show this brief little line, uh, uh, this brief little demo. Um, this is kind of like a tool that uh, developed out of what I showed earlier about this ranking tool. So uh, what was going on here is we are looking at an AIDS data set of a tabular, like a tabular AIDS data set. We have different countries and then we have lots of dimensions like uh, the country, the continent, uh, how many people know that they have HIV, the number of new HIV infections per 100 people in a time series as like this heat map in here. AIDS related deaths and death and then discrimination based on HIV uh, and like urban population percentages. And then we can add other things like, for example, like the world share um, dynamically and, and generate these kind of like um, visualizations. And so now this is a tabular visualization. And so I could like sort and rank um, like we did in our homework. But um, since I also like mentioned that this is this comes from this idea of the uh, of this ranking tool, we can like easily combine um, these uh, these elements and then create these uh, these rankings here. And I can like adjust the weight if I wanted to say, hey, I really like want to like give world share here like a higher proportion uh, dynamically, and I can like adjust this dynamically. Um, the cool thing about this tool here is that I can now also dynamically group. So for example, if I wanted to like group by continent. Uh, we now, like, uh, I've now grouped by continent and I'm showing like African countries. I have like a summary um, of all of these dimensions for the continent. And we can see that like for discrimina uh, discrimination, we have kind of like um, a, a distribution here of like um, which kind, like how, how, how much of a problem is discrimination. And we can then compare this across like uh, continents. And we can see that like discrimination based on HIV seems to be a bigger problem um, in, uh, in Africa than in other, on other continents. And we're kind of like showing here like a summary of all of Africa plus the top countries. Um, let's rank it by uh, the number of, of infections. And so now we can see um, like the top, like the most affected countries in Africa are Lesotho, Swaziland and Botswana. Uh, and in Asia, it would be Malaysia, Myanmar, and in Europe, it would be Latvia, Moldova, Ukraine. But we can see that relative, um, this is like um, less of an, an issue in uh, Asia or Europe, but it is actually more of an issue in some uh, North American countries like Haiti and Bahamas. Uh, but I, if I wanted to look at more, I could just like look at um, all of the countries in each of these continents dynamically. Um, and as of course, I can also filter so I could like remove, let's say, Asia, Europe um, and focus only on like Africa, North America and Oceania. Um, OK, so this is kind of like a, a tool to interactively explore the data. Um, and then we have um, another tool here that's called Birdifier um, that kind of goes back to Jacques Pertin, if you remember. Jacques Bertin was the guy who came up with the visual variables. Um, like he wrote this book about um, what is a mark in the channel and what are like how good are these. Uh, but he also developed um, ideas for like matrix-based visualization. Um, and so this technique here is for kind of like creating um, like figures for things like papers or reports based on tablet data. Um, and I'll show this brief video because it's also very, very cool in terms of interactions. When she moves her mouse on top of any tool icon, a tooltip appears at the top of the page to recall its function. Tools are organized in groups. Clara first expands the MISC group and clicks on the H icon adjacent to the first row to mark it as a header row. She does the same for the left column. 
Then she expands the shapes group in order to turn made values into shapes. She clicks on the circle icon next to the first drawer of the table in order to turn its values into black circles and squares. She is satisfied, so she presses the same icon on the next drawer and drags down until the last row. This instantly turns all table cells into circles and squares. Now Clara wants a more compact table. Each row can be resized independently using a slider placed next to it. Moving the slider to the right increases row height, while moving it to the left decreases it. She sets all rows to their minimum size by pressing on the topmost slider, drags down until the last row, then drags left to modify all selected sliders. She does the same for columns. She also zooms in using the provided functionality of the browser. Now she wants to tidy up the table. She drags over all black arrow icons, which immediately rearranges columns by visual similarity, which moves similar countries next to each other. She does the same for drawers. Now indicators that are similar are close to each other. To better see similarities, she removes the grid by setting all white separators and black separators to their minimum value. Clara continues to format the table to exhibit more patterns and convey a clearer message. This includes inverting the values of a row, importance of a good pay, to better show its correlation with another one, the household income. She also emphasizes two rows of a specific type by changing their visual encoding, increasing their height and dragging them aside. She encodes women's suffrage year using lines, and household income using a bar chart. She can choose to reorder only a subset of the rows or to reorder all rows. Now she can already see country groups with Czech Republic in between that she moves away. Finally, Clara adds separators and annotations to emphasize groups. So I really like this technique for um, like a the visual representation here is pretty cool, but I really uh, I think the cool the coolest part about it is like how you can like dynamically format a table like this with these cross filter interactions, what they're called. So um, yeah, just an example of what you can do um, to create like a nice tabular um, visualization. And then the big the big um, topic in in, in tabular um, displays is of course pixel based displays, um, and we talked about this briefly before these heat maps, and, and this is kind of like standard way of representing things like gene expression data in biology, for example. And the idea here is that each cell is a pixel, uh, and the color value or the um, color saturation or brightness is um, encoded, uh, like the values encoded in any of these dimensions. And of course, here the ordering is critical. So if you compare like these two charts here on the right, this one here is not ordered and you can't see really any patterns. But this one here is uh, clustered and you can see that there seems to be like there's like one red cluster here, one red cluster here, and then there's like this inverse relationship between this red and the blue here. So um, that's why like the ordering here that you have to kind of computationally find somehow with something like a clustering algorithm or some seriation algorithm um, is, is super important uh, for these heat maps. And so they are basically only used in combinations with clusterings. Um, the benefit, the big benefit of these uh, pixel-based displays or heat maps is that they're super scalable, right? I can show like one single pixel is enough to show an item. Um, and even if you go beyond that, you still get like a nice overview just because of your graphic card, graphics card, like giving you a good uh, approximation. Um, and so for like pure, like homogeneous numerical data, this is definitely a good choice. Um, and you see like a comparison here between a cluster heat map on the left and like a parallel coordinates plot on the right. Um, and I would maybe say that the parallel coordinates plot with the highlights here, um, well, isn't necessarily better, right? Um, it is It is kind of like you can see the cluster patterns in both of them, but maybe you can see that a little bit better, especially if you're not trained um, in the heat map. Um, so like just to recap, um, like the whole 3D piece, um, because something like that, that would be like a bar chart alternative, but I can just like show this as a heat map. And now in the left one, you, you really can't see a pattern, but in the heat map, you can clearly see a pattern. So if you have data like that, you do wanna use like uh, a heat map. 
The problem is that heat maps, because they're so popular, especially in biology, they also tend to be used for things where they're not so great. So this is like a heat map that um, if I gave you this as like an, an, uh, as an assignment, uh, you would probably all know, okay, red green is, is problematic. So we shouldn't do that. We've like learned about red green weakness, uh, but we also encode like a lot of different data types here with the same color. So like gene expression, mutation status, copy number level, all of this is kind of encoded with the same uh, color scale. So this is kind of like actually not a good example of using a heat map. Uh, you should probably use a different visualization technique for that here. And then remember, like this, this is the red green example. And so I just have a couple of slides in here to recap like some of the problems, but we've talked about them um, enough. So I'm gonna just jump over them. Uh, color is relative and so on. But here's an example of like a, a fairly big, like the 500 by 500 item heat map. And you can actually see some nice pattern, right? And if you compare this to like a parallel coordinates plot, that's completely unusable. So here, clearly we can see something in parallel coordinates plot. Really, this is just noise. Um, great. So to briefly wrap this up, um, you could also have non tabular space filling layouts. Um, we, we saw this before, like these um, tree maps. Um, so I'm not going to uh, talk too much about this. Uh, but there's also this idea of using things like regions or Hilbert curves and so on. Um, so um, this is a little bit esoteric, I would say. But just for completeness sake, um, you could just say I'm kind of wrapping uh, things around and I'm mapping multiple dimensions. And then I create these very dense displays. And then you get visualizations like that. Um, I'll leave it to you to judge whether this is a good idea or not. Um, and then we can conclude today's lecture. Um, I'm happy to take any questions and I'll start my office hour in like 15 minutes. Thanks, everyone.